Nelson, a legend of the full contact karate. You know, Johnny, very few people appreciate the beauty of a good right hand. I know, Brad. Or the symmetry, the way the right and left flow together. Or the poetry of a superfoot. It's him again. Guys, the hand is for showing off the PK ring of champions. and one of the greatest kickers of all time. You watch for that left leg and left hand of Bill Wallace. He uses that leg so quickly. He'll three or four or five kick from one side of the hip back to the other side, never have to drop the leg. He is a brilliant, brilliant fighter. Well, look at the people in that corner. Chuck Norris, Joe Lewis, and Mike Stone, all world champions. Right, every one of them, former world professional champion, legendary, a real unbelievable corner. of coffee and martial arts salute 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 cheers oh coffee amazing today and so is our very very special guest yes sir today we have here on the show one of the living legends an inspiration for many of us uh, and even for the new generations, he is one hell of a fighter, one hell of a martial artist, but most of all, an amazing human being. Right, yeah, he's known for his laughs and having a good time. And like he said earlier to me today, I've, I just have been having fun all these years. So um, I don't have a job, he said, I just have fun and I've been doing this for you know many, many years. So. This is just amazing, a great example of, um, you know, a person who has had an awesome career, 
Greater Than Life. Yes, sir. We have here with us today the great Bill Superfoot Wallace. Let's welcome the man. Hi, everybody. How are you? Hello, sir. Thank you for being here. Thank, well, thank you, you for having me. This is amazing. I'm so excited to have you here, sir. Well, good. Me too. Me too. I, finally, we got everything straightened out, so it should be fine. My wife did an absolutely fantastic job setting this up. Yes, I thank have you. No idea what's going on? Amazing. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, um, before we go live, we have. I mean, before we start, we have some comments. Uh, we already have people saying hello. Juan Martin Alvarez says. Great interview, salute to you all. He's saying hi from Argentina. We usually go live from the uh, International Hall of Fame of Argentina. Uh, so we have lots of people watching us there. Uh, they're a great team and they have um, a lot of wonderful martial artists that are a part of their community. So thank you, I've sir. I've been Argentina several times. They are absolutely fantastic people. Love going there. Great, great. Uh, Francisco Antonio Rodriguez Rubio says the biggest fighter, the biggest kicker fighter in history. Salute, he says. Uh, salute. Thank you. Uh, what a great character you are uh, giving us as a gift, Maestro Frank Soto. Thank you. Salute. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for being here, sir. Gracias. Gracias. Chris Lillalund, I guess I said that right. Uh, hello from Denmark. Ah, super. I'm supposed yeah. to go to, uh, my wife and I are going to go to Norway as soon as this pandemic is over. So we'll hope to see you come over from Denmark to uh, to Norway. We'll have a blast. Amazing. Sensei Patric Patricio Cifra saying hello from Chile. Ah, I go there with uh, with Sean Kelly a lot. We I was over there back in 1979 with Arturo Petit and nice. uh, had an absolute blast. Chileans are fantastic people. Great. Thank you. International Hall of Fame says, great. Uh, together with Bruce Lee, he is one of my referrals of the martial arts, says oh. uh, Sifu Ernesto Kolbrenner from Argentina. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Liam Brady says, hi, lads from Ireland. Love the show. Ah. Ruben Darío Aguilar. Uh, Salute to uh, Superfood. Oh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. In Espanol, Superpie. <laughs> Maestro Vidal from Chile. Hello, oh. Mr. Wallace. Roberto, Chile, thank you, Roberto. Great. Thank you, sir, for saying hello. Say, hey, hi. Hello to all the people in Chile. Uh, Mr. Sifra from Chile says he was with you when you went to Chile. He went to see you. See. Si. I want to see you again. Lo love to come down. Gracias, Sensei. Que lo quiere volver a ver. Dice que le encantaría ir para allá. Que le encanta ir a Chile. Patricia Sara Valdez. Hello from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Salud. Ah. Gracias. Maestro Vidal says, looking forward to see you. Hugs. Okay, we got... Said Khan, greeting Superfood and Maestro Soto from Cape Town. Oh. One, of, one of the first martial artist writers I followed in back, Black Belt Magazine along with Mr. Parker. He still looks fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We also got Willie Hernandez saying, God bless from Puerto Rico. Ah. And Catherine Letter Sumter saying, hello, Master Frank and Bill Superfood. Cheers from CCDP, the Pacific Northwest USA. Oh. Thank you, thank you. It's still cold up there. Oh, I bet, yeah. Well, sir, uh, I, I really wanna say thank you very much for uh, accepting being here. And um, um, I usually ask people, uh, the guests to give a brief, you know, background of who they are, but uh, I guess everybody knows you here, but if you can tell, how is it that you started in the martial art? That will be, that will be amazing, sir. It's kind of funny. I'm originally from Indiana the middle of the country, the middle of the United States. And our main sport in Indiana was basketball. Okay. Very, very huge sport. Well, you know, when I, when I was a freshman in high school, I was probably five, six, five, seven, maybe, and 89 pounds. 
So it was very difficult for me to play basketball against the freshmen that were, you know, five, 10, six foot tall, six, one, six, two, something like that. So I wanted to find another sport to do because I wasn't going to be any good at basketball. I was too short, too little. I'm walking down the hallways and I hear there's some commotion in this big old room. I look in the room and these guys are wrestling. So I walk in the room and the coach comes, going to help you. And I said, well, I want to, I want to do a sport. He says, well, how much do you weigh? And I said, not very much. He says, well, we, we can always use lighter weights and I'm a lighter weight. So I started wrestling as a freshman and, uh, Fell, fell in absolute love with, with the wrestling aspect of it. And the wrestling went into the judo training when I was in the service and also into the karate training in Okinawa. And uh, to this day, here I am. And I wow. like it. Wow. And um, so you did, uh, <clears throat> you started with wrestling, you went to judo, then you went to karate, and then you came back after your service, I'm betting, right? And, yes. and, uh, and you've um, made a decision to continue with the martial arts or how, how, what, what happened? Well, uh, I didn't make the decision. Uh, what happened is, uh, when I got out of the service in 1967, I went back to Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana to do, uh, my college work. I, my father always wanted me to be a school teacher. So I was going to go back and be a school teacher. In Indiana, there was very little martial arts. So I went back to Ball State to do, to study uh, physical education. I'm back there, I'm in the, I'm up in the, the men's gym, just kind of working out a little bit. A guy comes and says, you do martial arts? And I said, sure. He says, well, we're having a workout down in Indianapolis, which is the state capital, uh, this weekend. Why don't you come down and play with us? I said, okay. So I went down there, I met Glenn Keeney, I met Parker Shelton, met Bob Bowles, all of the, back then the Midwest best fighters, the Midwest best fighters and started working out with them and started training with them and so forth. Fell in love with all of them because we were great, great friends, especially Glenn Keeney, because he had a karate school called the Komakai Academy in Anderson, which was 18 miles away. So I would go there every night and, uh, and work out training. And we started going to tournaments and luckily for me, I started winning. And it was a lot of times, many times, I think eight or nine times, it was between Glenn Keeney and I, who was the grand champion. Because Glenn was the lighter weight than I was. I would fight in the heavyweight division. He would fight in the lightweight division. And a lot of times, nine times, we met in the, in the finals, the grand championship. So we, we had an absolute blast. And then I went back, then I graduated in 1972 from Ball State. I went down to do graduate work at Memphis State University. And uh, from there, I was I started training with a, a gentleman named Kong Ri and started teaching for him. And uh, 1972, 1973, I won a championship called the U.S. Championships in Dallas, Texas. I, I beat a guy named Skipper Mullins, who was an absolutely fantastic person. He just died last year, but absolutely a fantastic person. And... Uh, a gentleman was there watching the tournament named Elvis Presley. And uh, so I get back to Memphis and I and I'm just teaching class at Memphis, you know, at the at the at Congre School, and in walks Elvis Presley and he wants to meet me. Wow. So uh, we met and I, I, I was all, you know, you know, dumb out of it. And uh, so we met and I didn't think anything more about it. We just got together. Then I graduated. From, Ball, from Memphis State University, and Elvis called me up and wanted me to run a karate school for him. Wow. In Memphis, yeah. So, and then you, you brought up where my choice was to do this. Well, not really. Uh, I, was at, I was in Indianapolis, Indiana, right after I graduated from, from Memphis State, teaching uh -huh. martial arts, teaching karate for a guy named uh, Kenny Knudsen. I get this phone call from a guy named uh, Mike. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, shit. Mike Anderson. <laughs> Mike Anderson. And uh, Mike says, we're going to start something. This is 1974. Uh, we're working something and uh, we're going to do full contact karate. And I said, well, you guys have fun. You guys have a wonderful time. I don't want to get beat up. I don't want to get hit. Right now, it's fun. I can throw a kick. Think I could knock you out and not have to prove anything. 
but he talked and talked and talked. Now, people don't realize this, but Joe Lewis and I are very good friends. We're very good friends. He is also my senior. He was at Okinawa a year and a half before me. So he's my senior in Shorinru, in Shobashi Shorinru. Okay. Joe gets on the phone and says, Bill, you're going to do it. You are a middleweight. I said, I know I'm a middleweight, but I don't want to do it. He says, you're going to do it. I don't want to do it. He says, you're going to do it. And <laughs> still respect him being my senior. I said, okay, I'll try it. And absolutely fell in love with it. And uh, the funny thing is, if you saw, you saw me just a, 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 a couple seconds ago, I'm hitting a bag. I'm punching a bag. Well, I learned to box for two reasons. And I say this all the time in my seminars. The first reason was to keep you away from me so I could kick you. And the second right. reason was to keep you away from me so I could kick you. So <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, when a, when a guy boxer is in close working hand techniques and, you know, punching and so forth, it's very difficult to kick. So my jam was designed to keep you away so I could do the kicking. And if you got inside the leg, that's where the left hook came from. So it's all left side, super foot. And the hand, not that good, but it kept, kept everybody away from me. And that guy right there you're looking at right now is one bad dude. Joe Lewis, when we when we were competing in point tournaments, everybody's absolutely afraid, especially me. We fought three times, uh, twice in point tournaments and one time in our exhibition right here that you've seen. But uh, absolutely phenomenal. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so you started fighting because – because of your uh, uh, senpai uh, demand, I, right? I was told to. I was, <laughs> Joe Lewis is my friend, but he also said, you're going to do it. And I said, yes, sir. Great, great. And But then uh, you you build a taste for it, right? Because, I mean, oh, you yeah. did one hell of a career. Well, you know, it, it, I've always liked competition. I like the one-on-one -on -one competition. Uh, when we started kickboxing, Uh, the whole purpose of the kickboxing in karate, you know, you're taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of techniques. Same thing in the Kempo system. And right. of all those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of techniques that we're taught, we have to find, as the student, we find out which one works for us and which ones don't work for us. So we find the techniques that work and the techniques that don't work. Well, this is pretty obvious in kickboxing. Because if they don't work, you're going to get the crap beat out of you. So I found out that I had five techniques in my entire career. A jab or a back fist, a left hook or a ridge hand, and a side kick, a roundhouse kick, and a hook in, all with the left side. And if I'm fighting sideways, if I'm fighting this way to you, what do you really see to hit? The only thing you really see is my hit. Now the shoulder comes up. Now you don't see anything. Now I'm protected. Right. And if, if, one, if somebody wants to hit you, they have to go around? Yes. The shortest distance is a straight line, but you have to go around so I can see it. Now I can also right. get the hell out of there. <laughs> I don't want to get hit. Right, right. Over, you know? I, I've seen some of, of uh, your videos and stuff like that. I never had the pleasure of being in one of your seminars. But uh, I've seen some of the videos, and I see you do – you teach how to do a lot of setups – Like you're you're doing a roundhouse, then a side kick, then a hook kick with the yeah. left, with the, and the the other person cannot see what's going on. Well, right. The, the thing about it is, because I'm left legged, and I only have the left leg because my right leg was hurt in judo, so it's all left leg. So if my side kick doesn't look like my roundhouse kick or doesn't look like my hook kick, you can defend it. Right. If I throw a side kick at you, and it looks just like the roundhouse kick or it looks just like the hook kick, you've got to wait for me to actually throw the kick before you can defend. Now, right. understand, this time it's only about a foot and a half from you. It's too late. So up, and up to, thank God, up to this point, you picked the wrong thing to defend. And, and, and you also um, repeat that, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Side, round, hook, hook, round, side. Uh, the comedy, you know, my job when I was competing, because it was fun. I understand it, it was an absolute ball. That's why I'm smiling all the time, because I really enjoy it. But 
My job is to make you block something. And if you can't block it, that's even more fun. Because if you do block it, somewhere else, there's an opening. All I have to do is find it, or better yet, create it. Kempo system. Look at all the different techniques you guys have in the Kempo system. And your sets, and your, your sets that you have. You throw a technique. You def excuse me. You defend the technique. When he blocks that, you have another technique coming right after it. Then you have another technique coming right after that. So, so what that purpose is, what's the purpose of a combination? The purpose of the combination is to create an opening. And that's what I try to do. I want you to block. When you right. do block, that's even better because someplace else you're open. I hope. That's kind of what we're seeing right there in the video, right? Yes, sir. Yep. That's, see, the backfish, no way he wants to charge in when I throw that backfish. Then the kick comes around. If he's got the right hand up, the kick comes right around him because that's what it's called, a round house kick. I hope. Right. Amazing. Amazing. And well, fun. let me just share some more comments because we have more people saying hello here. Ah. Okay. Let's see. Maria Elena Araya Cortez, salute from Chile, Mr. Superfood Wallace. Oh, thank you again. Muchas gracias. Uh, Jose Antonio Fonseca says, good morning, Master Frank, Master Bill. It is an honor to have the opportunity to ask you a question. How do you remember your match against another legend like Joe Lewis in the USKA Championship in 1972, if I remember we perfectly? In, we were in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I was the defending champion. I'd beaten Joe in 1970 at the U.S. Hay Grand Nationals in Indiana. And I was defending champion because I'd won it also in 1971. He, he'd gone through the eliminations and just, just beat the crap out of everybody. And I'm going, uh-oh, I think Joe's chance to get even here. He won the heavyweight division. I, I, I retained the, the lightweight division. So we fight for the grand championship. Back and forth, back and forth. I'm kicking all over the place because I don't want him to hit me. And if you've ever seen Joe Lewis fight, he takes a stance like this. He's got his hands similar similar to this, right? Right. And, okay. Now, if you look at his right hand, it's like two golf balls on the end of his knuckles. And you go, holy crap. And he's going to hit me with those things. So I'm th every time he would take a deep breath, pff, I'm gone. He had to, he take, and I'm, go I'm running all over. I'm trying to. Trying, trying to survive. And all of a sudden, I said, hey, maybe I can set him up. So I, I throw a couple of kicks, pretty fast kicks, and he, he, he blocked him. I throw some other fast kicks, which kept him away from me. And then all of a sudden, I said, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. And we came charging. I threw the back fist. And what's the back fist designed for? To keep you away from me. So and he, luckily, he ran into it. So I got lucky. Nice. That's a little bit of sparring that you did. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's uh is that with is that with Joe? Yeah, I think so. Yes, sir. Oh yeah. Uh, he's getting me ready for the fight. And I, and he matter of fact, two weeks after I fought, it was it was his turn to fight. So he was fighting he was fighting in uh I think it was uh uh New Jersey or uh or uh, Providence, Rhode Island, I think. Right. But you notice he's big ahead moving around like he's he's floating like a butterfly. So, uh, who is your the, the toughest fighter you fought against, Mr. Every Lewis? One of them. Every one of Every them. One nice. of them. And, and, you know, the reason I say that, and, and re respect to all of all of all the guys, I remember their names. Uh, you know, Emilio Narvez, jo uh, Bobby uh, Thurio, you know, Robert Thurio, all these guys. I remember all of them. Why? Because every one of them had a chance to hit me. All of them took advantage of that chance to hit me, and. The one time that I got nailed really, really good, and and he he and I talked about it was Blinky Rodriguez. I fought Blinky in Las Vegas, I think 1977, 1978, before I was doing any boxing, and he hit me with a left hook that I you know I'm I'm looking around and seeing all these Guamanians floating all over the place. I'm going, what is all that stuff? Because he hit me really good, didn't go down. Matter of fact, I put my hands up, protect myself. But that's the hardest I've ever been hit, and he clocked me good. But uh, I came back and got lucky, won the fight. 
But wow. everyone, Robert, Robert Biggs, my last title fight uh, was superb. I mean, I hit him with some great shots and he just said, good job, my turn. And when you hit somebody with a really, really good shot and they just nod at you and say, here I come, you kind of go, hmm, can we talk about this? Nice. That's I, I believe that's your fight with Mr. Rodriguez with Blink. Yeah, no, no. This is uh, I think that's Emilio Narvez. Oh, okay. Up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. First round, uh, I catch him in the first round, stun him. And uh, you know, I'm saying, hey, this is a 19-year-old kid. At that time, I'm 30, 33 or 34 years old. And he's 19. And I catch him with a really good left hook in the, in the, in the end of the first round. And he's stunned. So I go back to my corner. He goes back to his corner. My, I turn to my corner man and says, this is not going to last very long because I got him hurt. I got him hurt. And I'm looking across the ring at him, and I actually see the little guy heal between the rounds. He does one of these numbers. And I went. <clears throat> so, you know, it, it's, it's how, you, you know, how you prepare for the fight. And, as, you know, I do seminars all over and a lot of guys said, well, what's your best knockout shot? Hey, you never know. I mean, look at look at Mike Tyson, as strong as he was in boxing. He never knocked anybody out with just one shot. It was right. always a combination. Right. And so, you know, I've had guys with really good shots and drilled them. Matter of fact, I, in our exhibition match with Joe Lewis in 1990, I hit Joe with an absolutely fantastic hook hit. I thought I killed him. I hit him great. Hit him right here. Thought I, I thought, oh, God, he's dead. He backed up and goes, ow. <laughs> this, this kid didn't mean a word of it, you know. I went, whoa. So, you know, that's where the speed comes in. Because, you know, not every time can you hit with a guy with your best shot. Sometimes you catch him and everything. And sometimes, you you know, you, you just play the game. But, you know, like as powerful as Joe was, as strong as he was, he could he could take some shots and uh, – Give them as well. Nice. Do you, uh, sir? Do you have any um, uh, like a ritual or a setup that you do uh, to get you in, in the zone before the fight, or do you just go there? No, I, I when I when I'm going when I'm in a fight, and this is I think everybody feels that way, and everybody that's ever fought will feel that way, including Mike Tyson and the current champions and everything. When I'm in when I'm in that dressing room, I'm dressing. First thing I say to myself is, what am I doing here? I could be someplace else having some fun. And I'll right. stretch out real good, warm up really good, and walk out into the ring. And I'm standing in my corner, looking at the guy across the ring from me, saying again, what am I doing here? Because I'm afraid. You know, in our sport, all it takes is one shot, one kick, one punch, something like that, at the right place at the right time, and you're dead. Not hurt, not mangled, but dead. And it can happen to any one of us. So I'm standing there scared out of my mind. Stretch out, do the right. And when the bell, luckily, when the bell goes ding, I'm ready. You know, if you if you watch Mike Tyson when he was fighting, you see him walking back and forth, back and forth across the ring. And the commentator says, look, look, just like a caged animal, just like a cage. No, he's just as afraid as the other guy is. Why? Because if he's caught with the right shot at the right time, he's dead too. Look at the times he's been knocked out. If the shot hits you at the right spot, you're in trouble. And and luckily, you know, I was not in trouble that much. Right, right. That makes that makes sense. So you learn um – Your background is in karate, right? Yes, sir. And but then you created your own superfoot system based upon the experience, like you said, uh, as a as a fighter, right? Yeah, Be, being able to use your your forward side, whether it be left side or right side. Oh, so it, uh, I'm guessing uh, Bruce Lee had that same approach, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I I've seen his movies, you know. Uh, I met him in 1967 at the uh, at the internationals in Las, in Los Angeles or in Long Beach, excuse me. And I met him briefly and uh, I was very, very impressed. He did the same thing that you or I do, but differently and and used the front side, the front leg, the front hand. 
uh, boxing techniques that, that, that's used in, in boxing, but but he made it look great. Fast, sneaky, quick, not hard. How, how strong can a 140 pounder be? So, so he made the speed work for him, just like 165 pounds. I try to make the speed work for me against the, the bigger guy, the stronger guy. So, uh, do you have any any um, uh, other uh, martial artists that have been your your inspiration or your models as a fighter? Yeah, Joe Lewis, Chuck Norris, Chuck Norris. Uh, we became friends in 1967 because I, I find a couple of his tournaments and did really, really, really well. So I met him there and, and we worked out together. I uh, met him at Ed Parker's. Remember when Ed Parker back in 1960, uh, 60, I think it was 66, 67, uh, Ed Parker had a, had a, a Shi'i, uh, just a good workout at his gym in, on, in Pasadena at okay. Colorado Boulevard. And I went there as a brown belt. My, my instructor took me and sparred with a whole bunch of guys. And everybody was, I guess, impressed with me. But uh, right. Had a ball. I met Chuck there, and the most fantastic person you've ever met in your life. Absolutely fantastic person. Right. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking also in, in the Kempo system of Mr. Parker, there's also a very heavy um, um, you know, tendency to work on the forward side, the strong side. Yes. Right? Yeah. Speed. Speed. It's the shorter distance, the quickness. And the defense can still be there. You know, if you throw a reverse punch and you're stuck way out here like this, look at everything now that's showing. But if I go boom, now see how the shoulder protects and everything? So right. I'm safe. You know, I throw the technique. I protect before. I protect during. And most of all, I protect after. Because I know maybe that shot's not going to work. So right. I'm going to be safe afterwards. You know, it's like in boxing, protect yourself at all times. Right, right, of course. Uh, in your, your superfoot system, uh, what's the, the, the objective of, 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 of your teachings or, or, the, or the student? What, what is he going to learn? Well, uh, the objective is the ideas. I want, I want to show a student. Most, most of the people that work out with me are, are previous martial arts students. They just want to learn. Uh, another way, not a better way, another way of doing techniques. So I'll teach him my sidekick, the way I throw my sidekick. I'll teach him my roundhouse kick, the way I throw my roundhouse kick. My hook kick, the way I throw my hook kick. And the forward hand, the jab, it's uh, ironically enough, if I do a seminar with gloves, with boxing gloves on, it's the jab and the left hook. If I do a seminar without gloves, it's a back fist and a ridge hand with the, with the inside of the hand. Why? Because it's safer. You know, you try to hit somebody with a punch like this in the face, you're probably going to break your hand. But this way, it's very safe because you hit with the inside of the hand right here, and it's very safe. Beautiful. Beautiful. But your kicks remain the same. Yes. Because I've, I've never thrown it hard. If you watch the videos, when back, I don't ever throw it hard. And I've never, luckily for me, I've never been countered. In my kickboxing career, I've never been, I've never had a kick countered. So, so that was makes me good because I just throw it quick. I throw the kick. If you're there, you're there. If you're not, you're not. I don't want to throw a little hard and fall into the kick because now it's your turn. Right. But the, the reason you haven't been countered is because you know how to do it effectively, right? Yes. Keep my distance. Uh, Joe Lewis, who, who is a fantastic fighter, uh, has his own system. It's called Joe Lewis Fighting Systems. But he, he teaches a method called in the pocket. In the pocket means I'm standing right next to you. Well, if I'm standing right next to you, my, maybe my hands work really good, but I can't kick. Even if I'm sideways, I can't kick. So I need that distance. I need a good three, four, five feet between us. So my legs will work. Leg will work, excuse me. So I can stick that side kick in and knock you back. Throw the roundhouse kick and get you to walk into it. Or throw the hook kick as a counter shot. Okay, so... So you could say that that injury you had when you were a, a judoka uh, on the right knee yeah. became a blessing or you or you just uh, made exactly no exactly you know because because you know when we did play judo you play left side you play right side you practice right. both sides of course you know, when i tore my knee up i don't have a right side 
And I heard it when I was in Okinawa. So what happens is I go down to the karate school in Okinawa and the guy said, I'm in a cast from my ankle all the way up to my, to my crotch. And the, and the instructor says, Oh, you, you do karate. I said, well, you know, got the problem here. He says, no problem. You stand up. So I stand up and uh, he says, we do psychic. We do yoga getting. I said, okay, what's a yoga getting? He said, side kick. It's a side kick. I went, okay, fine. And he, he brings his leg up and throws a side kick. I said, well, I can't move. He says, no problem. So I'm standing. I just bring it up and stick the side kick out. You know, so, so this kind of happens, right? And, uh, and did 14,000 of those things. Came back the next week. We did Mawashi Getty. Roundhouse kick. So same thing. Now, you notice I didn't say anything about the hook kick. A couple months go by. My leg heals pretty good. So I go back to the class. We're going through regular class, and then we do kumite. Now, you're familiar with what kumite is, right? Yes, sir. Kumite is sparring. Well, right. we didn't know that. I didn't know that back in no. 1960, 1967. He said, I said, what do you mean kumite? He says, we spar. Now, understand, for months, we've been going, aya, 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 right? And, and, and the instructor saying, this punch can kill somebody. If you throw this correctly, this punch can kill somebody. Now we're going to spar. This is before equipment. This is before sparring equipment. So he said, now we're going to spar. I went, huh? We're going <laughs> to spar? Yeah, yeah. But we use Kimmy focusing. I said, okay. I've never done that before. So we'll try it. So we're spar I'm sparring with one of the Sandans, 30 degree black belts. And I throw the sidekick at him. And he slips it to the side. And I brought the heel around and catch him in the chest and drop him. I went, uh-oh, again, you know, chain of command. So I'm here at attention. He, what'd you do? What'd you do? I went, bah, bah, I threw, I threw Yonke Getty. And when you backed up, I just brought the heel around because I didn't want you to kill me. I brought the heel around, if nothing else, to push you away. Well, I caught him with the heel right in the solar plexus. And he went down. He said, ah, what? Getty. What? What's a Getty? Hook and kick it. It's a hook and kick it. So that's where it all came from. The three kicks, side round, hook kick. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Beautiful. It's a great story, you know. <laughs> that's, it. that's amazing. Yeah, I love that. Uh, uh, okay, before I ask some more questions, let me say some of the more uh, more comments, share more here. Uh, Angelo Rossini, the real Iron Man, Bill Wallace. Oh, I got, it, you know, I, I love I like I love the accolades and I love the my fans out there and thank you all very much. But I'm just like you. We did it when we first started doing this. We did it for fun because it was very, very enjoyable. And then we became karate instructors. I started teaching at Memphis State University, which is even more enjoyable because now I can teach people and take keep them day after day after day. So they're my students. And then when I started competing, it was fun. I had a blast. And it, because it was fun, it was that one-on-one -on -one competition. And then the kickboxing, well, it wasn't quite as much fun. But at the end, it was it was a blast. And I still love it to this day. So I thank all you guys very, very much. But again, I'm like you. We did it because we enjoyed doing it. We had a blast. And how was, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we don't understand how it was back in those days with the beginning of the martial arts in America. Uh, not not in the history, of course. It's been there, you know, centuries uh, old. But how was it when they took it from you know from the Asian country, Japan, China, and so forth, into America, and you started with all this? How, how was it? How was the, the context? Yeah. I started doing martial arts in '65 in uh, in in Okinawa. Uh, back then, very 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 little martial arts in the United States. There was judo. That's because it was an Olympic sport. But the judo, it like uh, it, that was the martial arts, you might say. And then karate showed up. And then the kempo showed up. But karate, when I, when I first came to, back to the United States in 66, there was Shodokan, Gojiru, uh, Shoreru, and Shorinru. That's, the, that's the, probably the four basic systems that are in the United States. And plus the kempo system from... Uh, from Ed Parker. But what happened is that being Americans, being uh, people that are, are available to change, the tradition 
you know, you go, well, uh, uh, from this movement here, everybody did that, right? From the hips, oh yeah, they, son, she. So you, after a while you go, well, hold it down. I'm not ever gonna fight somebody this way. But that's the way we train, just to get the, the hips and the shirt and the turning into, so you had a basic techniques. But after a while, you do this, right? right. And then you go, well, hold it now. I just did three months of doing this. Now you're going to say, this is the way I want you to do it. So you go, so I just wasted three months because I'm going to stand here like this. You're going to come in. I'm going to go, boom, bring his hand back down here to the waist to throw the reverse punch, right? So I just developed a bad habit. Yes. In boxing, in boxing yes. you start here, you jab out, you cross out, you come back to this position. You don't right. go. And come back up, but we did that. But the, the basics, what the, what the traditional karate did, is very fantastic because it gave us the basis. This gave us a base so we could change. You know, just like uh, the movement that we work, we wouldn't be where we were if we didn't have the basics. My Gary, my I can't. If I'm left side forward, I can't throw my Gary front kick because my knee's bad. If I throw the front kick and it if I don't touch something, it'll come out of joint. You'll never see me throw a front kick, ever. I threw one in my entire career. One. But it wow. wasn't my left leg. <laughs> so, but again, uh, good looking guy. That's when I had hair. The pictures up there is when I had hair. But uh, it's it's still, it's we owe so much, we owe so much to our instructors because they teach us the basics. They teach us the movement, the reason behind something. Not just, this is the reverse punch, do it this way. This is Gakuzuki, Oizuki, Seikenzuki, Gate Amberai. You know, different blocking techniques, different block. We would not be where we were if we didn't have the basics. And why do you think that the Japanese do that, that pulling the hand back, that Kime or whatever? Um, uh... I believe. I have, a, I have a master's degree in kinesiology and physiology of exercise. Right. And I think the reason they teach that is an equal and an opposite reaction. And you notice as I'm doing this, my hips are turning and my shoulders are turning. Right. So now I'm getting torque, twisting force into that punch. Mm -hmm. And this is adding more, more muscles come into play. So there's more power there also. Okay. And I think these guys back 300 years ago, didn't know that, but they knew the movement. They knew the feeling behind the movement. And there's where my power comes from. That's where my speed comes from. You know, you throw a technique correctly and the speed is automatically there. You can throw it fast and be wrong, but what good is it? You know, when I teach my kicking techniques, I always try to touch a, touch a target. Like we'll turn sideways and kick each other in the arm with the, like the side kick. Well, if you hit here one time and then hit down here the next time then throw it over here the next time, then over here the other time, what good is the kick if you can't hit your target? You can put your finger exactly where you want to put it 1,000 times out of 1,000. I can go beep, 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 beep. But try to, try to put a board out there and put a circle on it and use that sidekick and hit that board 10 times out of 10 times. It's difficult. Yes. And and people don't want to do it. So they'll throw kicks. Think about it. In the old days, you had a mirror. You looked in the mirror. Everybody was facing the mirror. You do the kicking techniques, the front kick, side kick, hook kick, round kick, spinning kick combinations, right? Hoping, hoping that you did it correctly. Yes. Without ever hitting anything. Yes. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So what we've done over the years and years and years, changed it a little bit and make it more effective. I would like to think. Maybe not, but for me, it was more effective because because of my kicking, I want to be able to not hit it, but I want to be able to touch it. Because if I can touch it, I can lean into it a little bit. Now I get another five or six inches and you go through the wall. So a lot of the changes you have done has to do more with training. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the funny thing, too, is, is, and I don't mean to sound bad for anybody, but you know what a key eye is, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Key eye, right? Well, if you think about it in boxing, boxers have the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's called an exhalation of air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Right. When you exhale, what do you automatically have to do? Tense. 
Think about it again. Exhale real hard, Frank. Exhale. What'd you just do? I moved do the body. Hard, hard. What'd you just do? You I, breathe back in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You exhaled and then breathe back in. Of course. If you go and then try to punch, I'm not going to let you breathe back in. But if it's a natural movement, it's already there. So that makes it, it's like watching these forest people go, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but so it's, it's a nice quick exhalation of air. So you naturally bring it back in, which keeps the blood flowing, which helps get rid of the lactic acid in the, in the muscles. So now you have endurance. I hope. Nice, nice. I'm sorry, I'm taking notes. This is very no, no, no. Hey, I'm having a blast. I'm having a great time. It's, it's fun talking about what you do for a living. Oh, yeah. Agree. Agree. That's why we, I really enjoyed this, this uh, interviews. Oh, this is amazing. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. We have more comments. I just want to uh, bring uh, everybody say hi here. Okay. Rafael Herrera, Master Bill Wallace. For me, it's a big honor to make you a question. Uh, how long and how much time or how, sorry, did you uh, elaborate or created the fastest leg in the world? And um, I called you the big one with a lot of uh, caring, sir. Oh, Grandmaster. Thank you, sir. For 165 pounds, I'll, I like the big sound. <laughs> But the, 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 the quickness, the speed comes from the relaxed movement. If you look at all any kind of a, a kinesiological book or an anatomy book, a relaxed muscle is a quicker muscle. It's also less prone for injury. So what happens is I bring the leg up and snap it out. I never extend it. If you watch all the fights, I throw the kid out, bring it back. I don't stick it out and then just drop it out and back. This way, the snap causes the speed. I don't hyperextend the knee joint and it snaps out, snaps back, just in case I need to do it again. So the speed comes from a relaxed movement. I, my, when I was doing my undergraduate work, my, uh, one of my professors wanted to know why I'm a white guy and I'm fast. So what happened is uh, we found out through the testing and so forth, I have, a, I have a, an ability to relax my non-using muscles. You know, like if, if I throw a back fist, the main, magic, the main muscle doing the work is the triceps from this but I have a good chance to relax the biceps brachii, which is right here. So nice right. and relaxed, out and back, nice and relaxed. So that's the movement that, that I've worked with all these years for the aspect of my joints are fine because I don't hyper extend. Snaps out, snaps back, just like a back fist. So I can come out right back. Right, that, that, that actually makes a lot of sense because I have a lot of friends and, and seniors in the art that get um, um, injuries like hip replacements and stuff yeah. like that because they did a lot of kicking when they were younger. Then they yeah. always in bags and kick something hard, so you have that compression, you have that compression in there. So so it's going to damage it after a while. You know, I'm, I'm 75 years old and I have an absolute blast doing seminars. I still stretch out. I can still do the splits. I still do all the kicks, all the boxing techniques, and it's it's fun. You know, because I'm not going to allow myself to get injured. I'm not going to throw something real hard and try to hit something or someone really hard because for all these years, I've known that the speed has done it for me. I'll get you to walk into it. If you walk into it, I don't do any work. You do all the work for me. That, that makes perfect sense. So... It's always better to be relaxed because not just because of the speed, but because of yeah. non injuries, right? And the second part of that little thing, a relaxed muscle is a quicker muscle, but it's also a relaxed muscle is less prone for injury. You know, look at a car wreck. Look at a car wreck. Who doesn't get hurt? The guy that's drunk. Yes, yes, yes. Or the one that gets knocked down faster. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So he's nice and relaxed, flopping all over. Yep. Yeah, yeah, agree. Amazing, amazing. Angelo Rossini says, amazing. Justin Earhart says, Phoenix, Arizona, he still inspires me. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I'll be October, the first weekend in October, Phoenix, Arizona, I'll be in Flagstaff, Arizona. 
Nice. Swing at Center that first weekend in October. So come on up and see me for my beautiful. students in winter. Beautiful, beautiful. Said Khan says, I graded under Grandmaster Dennis Tostin from AmeriKick, and he had a couple of funny stories of yourself and the late Joe Lewis. It sounded like you two were real, really great friends. We were super friends. Uh, you know, it, uh, on, on it, people don't realize, but on, uh, a lot of times you'll see me do a seminar. At the end of it, we'll all get together for a photograph, and I'll say, well, it looks like a great choral group here. So we're going to do my, Joe Lewis is our, my favorite song. And that song is called California Dreaming. So we'll sing California Dreaming. It's easy because all I do is I say, all the leaves are brown. And then, Frank, you'll say, all the leaves are brown. All the leaves are brown. And right. the sky is gray. And then you'll say this. So it's a real easy song to follow. But it's just a remembrance of Joe with all the great things that he did. None of us would be here if it wasn't for Joe Lewis. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, and also, sir, you had um, lots of experience, uh, you know, uh, you went into the movies. You did uh, a lot of films, a lot of fighting scenes and stuff like that. There's a, let me see, there's a picture of you here with uh, with none, none less than. Oh, that's Mr. Jackie Chan. Yeah. He killed wow. me in this movie. He killed me. I died. I didn't like him at all for that, but he killed me in the movie. I, well, I got electrocuted. But we, yeah, it was it was funny because when we when we did the movie, the great thing is we choreographed the fight scenes ourselves. The stunt guy didn't say this is what I want you to do, but we choreographed the fight scenes, so it made it really really good. I get nice. to beat him up for a while, and then he kills me. And you did several movies, sir. Did sixteen of them. Sixteen. Of them. Did, that's uh, I think this is uh, uh, I don't know who it is. Is oh. Uh, God, I can't remember what we did. That. I think we did. Uh, oh, this is the one we did up in San Francisco. So I don't know why I don't have a top on because it's cold out there. I bet. <laughs> yeah, there's there's uh, some interesting stuff here that you can oh, find in the media. Oh yeah, that's some of these some of these things. That, oh oh yeah, okay yeah. That's what I did with Tadashi Mashita. I get to kill people. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we had fun. I bet, I bet. It, it looks like fun. Yeah. So, let's see. We have a little bit more comments, and we're almost out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. that's, that's the, it, it goes fast. It really does. Uh, Mr. Edward Chavez says, Arizona here, sir. <clears throat> Good. Okay. Well, again, we'll see you the 1st of October, I hope. Come on yes. up. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Catherine uh, Sumter says, I know there's going to be a zillion questions, so I better get mine in, Mr. Bill. Any thoughts or memories about Screamer stick fighting? Are you familiar with Kakoi Cañete Doce Pares? Do you like the Filipino arts? I'm a big fan of yours from back in my Taekwondo days. Uh, uh, I really respect the Screamer, the movements. Uh, Danny Inosano is a very, very good friend of mine. And uh, he, he had he absolutely superb with the sticks and with the knives and, and the blades and stuff like that. So uh, I never did like weapons. You know, uh, my, I, I don't mean, I, I mean this to sound funny, but if I was going to use a weapon, it'd be an Uzi. You know, because at that point, I don't have to get you with the first one because I had 18 more of them coming right after that one. But again, you know, I, I love the, the, the empty hand aspect so much that, that yes. I, I just trained for it so much. Now, again, when I was in Okinawa, we had to learn weapons. We had to learn the bow. We had to learn the tamfa. We had to learn the nunchaku. We had to learn the sai. We had to learn the kama uh, and, and the oar. Uh, but it never interested me that much because I always liked just the punch and then a kick. Nice, nice. And the sights. If we did for if we did forms in competition, if you notice, you do it left side and then you do it right side, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a right side. I have to protect right. the right side. So, so I, I, you know, if they let me do a form all left side, that might be okay. Like shadow boxing, in, you know, in the boxing aspect. Right, right, right. Of course. Uh, okay, Marcelo Cajido Rodriguez. Saludos from Argentina. Okay, 
Mr. Angelo Colado, greetings from LA, much respect. Oh, thank you, sir, thank you. James Leonard, hello, sir. You were an inspiration for me and my kicks back in my competition days. Oh, well, thank you. Just keep kicking. Remember, it's fun kicking people. <laughs> nice, nice. Mr. Marcelo Rodriguez asks, says, hello from Argentina, one question. Uh, he wants to know if you have uh, the awareness that you are a legend, a living legend, and an example for many. And how do you handle that? Well, people have given me this title many times. Uh, and I really, don't get me wrong, I appreciate it very much. But I just enjoy working out. I enjoy teaching people. I enjoy the training. I really enjoy the, the, the competition aspect of it. And, you know, uh, all of you guys that are right in, have just as much opportunity as I do. Uh, I got, luckily in my competition, I was at the start of it, where, where we all became very, very, very well known. There's tons of fighters out there now that nobody ever heard of. This is, this is the funny thing. Frank, this is what we do for a living, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Who was national champion last year? In what? Karate. <laughs> point tournaments. Uh, you can't even that. I couldn't tell you the top 10. I could because excuse me, there's so many of them nowadays. Don't cover it. Black yeah. Magazine has some tournaments in it once around, but not who the top 10 fighters were. Back in my day, you looked at the list because it had a list at Black Belt who the top 10 fighters were and how I did against those top 10 fighters. And if you see maybe the top 10, maybe you're in the list. Or maybe you're in the top 20. But now they don't even cover tournaments. And it, it's easy because, hell, there's probably five or six tournaments every week somewhere in the United States or Mexico. Yes. So you say, wow, nobody knows. So nobody cares about us anymore. Now yeah. they care about the B B BJJ or, or stick fighting or, or, you know, Crab Maga now, something like this. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of us out there that like to do the punching and the kicking part. Right, right. Marcelo, el maestro dice que muchas gracias, que él en realidad eh, se ha divertido mucho con esto y que tuvo suerte de que cuando él empezó como peleador no había tantos peleadores, no había como hay ahora tantas divisiones, tanto y, y, y todo el mundo sabía quiénes eran los campeones y eso le, lo, lo elevó a ese estatus, eh, pero que en realidad cualquiera de nosotros o cualquiera de ustedes puede hacerlo si se esfuerza y eh, puede llegar uh, con el mismo éxito. Okay. Sorry about that, sir. I need to trans translate fast. Wait. I had no idea what you said. <laughs> I just paraphrase a little bit of what you said. Okay. I still didn't understand it. <laughs> oh, okay. I understand that. Okay. I thought okay. it was another question. Marco Antonio Gonzalez Arana. Best regards, Grandmaster Bill and Frank Soto. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Maestro Carlos Garcia Guidobro, Excelencia, Excellency, salute from Santiago de Chile. Oh, gracias. I was in Santiago uh, several years ago, had a blast. I had a Santiago, went up to the mountains and had a blast. I had McDonald's, I had McDonald's in Santiago. And nice. It was very good. Maestro Carlos dice que muchas gracias, que él estuvo en Santiago <laughs> hace unos años y que subieron la montaña, que la pasó muy bien, y que también comió McDonald's en Santiago, dice. <laughs> you got the McDonald's part, sir. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> Mr. Damien Abbott good. says, uh, when I started training in the late, uh, I mean, in the very early 80s, watching Mr. Rokitis and Mr. Wallace fight had a certain spectacle to it. Although they fought, they fought with class. They respected their technique and they respected their opponents. I'm not saying today's MMA practitioners don't respect their opponents, but the class... Uh, has gone and with it a generation that reminded us that the playground fight should remain precisely there, the playground. I have met the very people within martial artists. Yeah. Well, you know, with, with the MMA aspect of it, uh, the reason the MMA started because of, of the groundwork involved. You right. know, uh, I've always thought that MMA was like two gladiators fighting, except this time the loser doesn't die. You know, because, uh, again, you know, it's a sport. It's designed as a sport. And and the rules are designed to protect 
both fighters, the ones, the, you know, the one doing the technique and also the one receiving the technique. So we need, we need that, those rules and we need the respect. Respect is very important. The Gracies, when they first started, showed all the respect in the world. They still do. But some of the guys that join into the sport, they're into it just because they want to fight. You know, if you're going to learn, if you're going to learn a martial art, if you're going to do martial arts, at least try to learn one, you know? Right, 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 great. Well, thank you, sir. Um, we have so many comments. I'm not, we're not going to have time to, uh, to show them all. Uh, Chinobi White Wolf says, Genio, genius and a champion. Uh, Mr. Villar Villarroel says, good afternoon, big master. Salute from Brazil, Manaus. Salute to the great of the greatest, the greatest of the greatest, Ms. Master Bill. God bless. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Jose Antonio Fonseca, Master Bill, what was your most serious injury? My knee. Okay. My knee. When in judo, when the guy fell on my knee and tore the medial ligament. That was the most serious. That started my career in, kick, in, in karate. So it was serious, but it wasn't, sir. It was, it was almost like a godsend. Nice, nice. International Hall of Fame, uh, ask for Bill, how, which uh, are uh, the best friends that martial arts gave you? Uh, probably Glenn Keeney. Glenn Keeney from Anderson, Indiana, because we travel all over the world together. When, we, when I was in college and he worked in Anderson, he, I, we had a, it was a quarter system. So we, every 10 weeks, we would have nine days off. So he'd take a vacation And we traveled in the United States as far as we could in four days, stopping every night in a different karate school, sparring, working out with everybody. And then we'd come home a different way. We might drive out to Phoenix, drive up to, to uh, Denver, Colorado, and then drive back from Denver. So we, for four years, Glenn and I had an absolute blast. And then again, my friends, uh, uh, Chuck Norris, Joe Lewis, Mike Stone, We, we still keep in touch. Mike and I still keep in touch. Joe and uh, Jeff and uh, Chuck and I still do too. Um, dice que sus mejores amigos, uno de ellos es Glenn Kenneth y también eh, Chuck Norris eh, 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 y, yo, y Joe Lewis. <coughs> uh, perdón. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. Well, sir, um, let's see. Kurt Javelin says, great interview, Master Soto. Thank you, sir. Martin Perez, salute uh, to the champion from Argentina. Um, thank you. Um, many greetings to you, Teacher Bill Wallace from Argentina. A big hug, the best of Chinobi White Wolf. Thank Luis you. Gonzalez. Thank you very much. I'll take it. I'll take it. Luis Gonzalez says, congratulations for the show. A big one of the martial arts. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, I just want to say I'm sorry to everybody that uh, I didn't have the time to, uh, you know, to show all of the, the hellos. John Ward sets two legends together. I, no, no, no. It's not about me. It's about the guests. Yes. No. <laughs> we're, to get, we're together in this, right? We're together. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. No, I, I would never dare to say, you know, that I'm close to her and I, I, you got all my respect. And yes, you are an inspiration to all of us newer generations. Mr. Axel Cardenas, my respect and admiration to the living legend Superfoot. Uh, uh, please tell us about those moments that you share with Senior Grandmaster Ed Parker and your visits to Chile in the 80s when they uh, uh, had you on a TV show, the Sábado Gigante. Please. Right. Well, I, in 1979, December 1979, I went over to Chile for a gentleman named Arturo Petit, one of Ed Parker's students. Right. And, uh, and did some seminars over there and had a blast. And that night, he says, we're going to go to a, we're going to go to a, a, a kickboxing match. I said, super. So I go to the kickboxing match. I walk in. I see this ring down the middle of everything. And there's about 40 men sitting around the ring dressed in uniforms. I said, what are they going to do? And they said, you're going to spar them. I said, what? He said, you're going to spar those 40 guys. So I went, wow. I said, okay, no problem since all these people are here. So I said, I got them all together. I said, okay, we're going to go out and have some fun. I'll go as hard as you go. If you try to hit me, I'll kill you. Just kidding. 
But, you know, hopefully, you know, because, you know, I don't want the first guy to try to hit me, try to hurt me. And then I have to nail him or something like that. And now the other 30 now are going to go one of those things. So, but we had a blast. It was superb. And then I went there a couple more times for some, for Kempo people and also for some Taekwondo people. I had a great time. I had a great time. Nice. And then I've gone down there for, for Sean Kelly. Beautiful. Salute to Mr. Kelly. Sean Kelly was the one that made this possible uh, uh, to have you here on the podcast, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are out of time. I mean, I could, uh, you know, keep on asking questions. And I know you have so many interesting stories, but uh, I don't want to be abusive of your time, sir. I really appreciate that you did this. Thank you. To everybody listening, just remember, it's fun kicking people. So write that down in your book. <laughs> I agree. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody that was here watching. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to say all of the comments or uh, um, bring them all up. I'm just going to put them right there fast for you. Uh, thank you, Rafael Herrera. Thank you, Jose Miguel Ponce. Thank you, uh, C Central Coast Campo Karate. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chavez, uh, Chris. Thank you, Jorge Antonio Uribe. Mr. Nassim Holmes, thank you from Cape Town saying hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Marisaisa. Good morning. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chinobi, White Wolf. Gracias. Alfred Magnan, say good to see you again, Mr. Wallace. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Julio Millan, uh, thank you. Much congratulations from such a great uh, guest. Thank you, sir. Um, JJ said, Master Chuck Norris and Master Wallace are two of the most imp inspirational martial artists I had growing up. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank tip you. of the cap to both to you both. Thank you. Kempo Art says, Mr. Wall, much respect and honor to ask you a question, sir. Did you ever do any sparring with Elvis back in the day? Well, that's a good no. question. The, the answer to that is no. For the main reason, Elvis was a great technician, a very good Kempo practitioner. The trouble is we couldn't spar because he could not take the chance of even accidentally getting hit in the head or getting hit in the ribs, breaking a rib or popping his lip or giving him a black eye. So he couldn't take the chance, but it was absolutely fantastic at self-defense. Wow. Wow. So he was a good martial artist, right? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And so were his people. Uh, uh, Red West, Jay yes. Shelley, all those guys, all of his Memphis mafia were very yes. good martial artists. They worked out with me. Nice, nice. Mr. Hebler was there too, right? Dave Hebler was there also. Right, yeah. right. Card uh, Cardinas Campo Karate Toyo, my friend Fijo. Okay, Mr. Scott Higgins, good morning, Sensei. Mr. Wallace, I always appreciate your positive me me message. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we have a question. Okay, so there's a Japanese guy asking here a question. And you can read that? Uh, no, but we have a translator here right oh. now. Okay, <laughs> okay. So my friend in, in Japanese said, what advice do you give to those who want to uh, self-discover their unique expression or, or, or martial unique expression like you did, sir? Experiment. The best thing you could do is experiment. This is Now, understand everybody this. Everybody in this world is built differently. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses different flexibilities, but above anything else, we're different psychologically in our mind. So why we do something is just as important of what we do. And when you put all that together, you have me. Because I can't do things that some of you guys can do, but maybe what I do is better for me than what it is for you. So experiment, play with it, change it, modify it. So it'll work for you, otherwise it's no good. Ok. Uh, Sensei Wallace dice que experimenten, que experimenten eh, con, con el arte, que cada quien está construido de manera diferente, que tienes eh, físicos distintos, fortalezas diferentes y que piensas de forma diferente. Que cuando tú experimentas y juntas todo eso, vas a tener al individuo, a la persona única. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Domo arigato gozaimasu. Um, gracias por la pregunta. Wow, sir. Um, well, 
Uh, okay, Kurt Jablin says, where in Flagstaff is the seminar in October 1st, sir? I want At to attend your event. Pictures. Maximum Martial Arts. What's that again? Maximum Martial Arts. Absolute Martial Arts. Great. Maximum, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, saying hello, and thank you for your questions. Much appreciated. Muchas gracias. Domo arigato. Gracias a todos. And thank you, sir. Is there anything you want to add just to close Thanks, up? Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir. Okay. You have a great day, sir. I thank will do it. We got the rest of it coming up, so I'm going to have fun. I'm going to take the dogs out for a walk. Thank you, sir. Take care. Gracias.